this briefing um, from Environment America, which is an amalgamation of organizations around the country, looks to focus on offshore winds. And we've been organizing a series of webinars like this on other critical issues for state legislators, state legislative staff, and other commissioners so that we can have an opportunity to hear from some of the experts. Um, today, that's exactly who we have here. We have the chair of the California Energy Commission, David Hothschild, and the executive director of Turn Forward, Stephanie McClellan. We, I've asked them each to talk for about 10 minutes about offshore wind and in particular for the chair of the California Energy Commission to talk about the exciting work that's happening here in California and for the executive director of Turn Forward to talk about all of the exciting offshore wind opportunities that are happening, not just in California, but all over the country. After that, we'll have a little bit of time for questions and answers. And we're asking folks, if you have a question, please put it in the chat and message it to Stephen King. He's gonna organize all the questions that we have so that we'll be able to sort of get to as many as we can in the time allotment that we have and um, be able to move forward from there. Um, I will say that offshore wind is an incredibly exciting issue to be working on right now. Um, there's both at the federal level, the president has made incredible uh, programs and announcements about the importance of offshore wind and set goals for it. And here in California, just recently, um, the California Energy Commission set a goal of having 25 gigawatts of offshore wind in place by 2045, which would make California the leader on offshore wind around the country. And so we thought it very appropriate to bring these two experts together to talk about offshore wind. Um, I should probably just have them jump off and sort of jump into this discussion. And we're going to start with the chair of the California Energy Commission. So Chair Hochschild, why don't you tell us a little bit about offshore wind here in California and all the work that's happening? Well, thank you so much, Dan, and good to see everyone. Um, so I want to begin by saying that, uh, you know, we pride ourselves on being first on electric vehicles and energy storage and rooftop solar, but really California is um, behind uh, the East Coast and, and Europe on offshore wind. I really want to congratulate the incredible leadership uh, in states like Rhode Island and New York, New Jersey, and Massachusetts and others that are moving forward with offshore wind. We have a lot to learn from you, but um, we had a banner year uh, in 2022 um, on a couple levels. Most importantly, we went through a process. Um, we were given authority at the Energy Commission by the governor and the legislature to set the state uh, goal for offshore wind. It went through an extensive public process for that and landed at 25 gigawatts by uh, 2045 and up to five gigawatts by 2030. And um, just for context, our peak load in California uh, is about 52 gigawatts. That's a really substantial commitment. But what we're doing right now and the context within which offshore wind fits is that we're electrifying almost everything. So the climate strategy, the future of the economy runs through the electric grid. We're adding about a thousand electric vehicles a day to the roads in California. We're electrifying buildings uh, and uh, really everything is, you're just seeing this expansion of this clean electric grid uh, into further, further reach around the, around the state. Um, and so we'll need a lot more power, uh, not just offshore wind. Uh, we wanna obviously complement that with, with rooftop solar and geothermal. Uh, and all the rest. Uh, but offshore wind plays a really unique and very important role. It, it is producing power at precisely the time of day when we most need it, the late afternoons and evenings when solar is going down. It's a much superior, uh, stronger resource than wind on land. Um, and we have an 800 mile coast, coastline. So this is really a chance to take advantage of that. Um, we also did the very first lease sale on December 6th uh, in close collaboration with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. I do want to thank uh, the incredible staff and team there for their work on that. That was the first lease sale off the West Coast of the United States. We will be pushing for another one to follow, but that was 583 square miles, on uh, two zones off the central and the north coast of California. Uh, and the zones don't begin until 20 miles offshore. So that's, a, a, I think, an important feature of this. So um, one of the most important differences between the East Coast and the West Coast is we have a deep water shelf. So this means we'll be doing principally floating wind technology. I've had a chance to visit installations uh, with floating wind projects in Portugal and in Scotland. I can tell you, you know, for those of you who haven't, haven't had a chance to see those yet, 
you really can't tell that they're floating the way the mooring lines uh, keep them stable. They're you know incredibly um, well designed, uh, very stable even in high seas. And um, I have a lot of confidence this is um, absolutely scalable. Um, obviously, Europe is adding about five gigawatts a year of wind, uh, principally um, not floating, but the floating market is growing. Uh, and I have every confidence we'll be able to, to scale this in time. One of the things we're doing, though, to help drive down the costs is we are joining along with um, every other state in the U.S. that's doing offshore wind in supporting the National Offshore Wind Research and Development Consortium. California's joined that. And we're going to be investing together with our uh, sister states in innovation to drive the cost down, get larger scale for the turbines, uh, and so forth. Um, a few other points I'd, I'd make. One of the emphasis we're, we're trying to make as we do this is to really make sure we're delivering the benefits of the offshore wind assembly manufacturing um, elements to the state. And so that's a major focus for us is um, seeing to the greatest degree possible to have uh, that fabrication occur here in California um, and to, to deliver benefits to the local communities. And this is something I think it's a commitment, not just for offshore wind, but really across the growth of our clean energy economy, making sure we're lifting up the communities uh, in which these projects are getting installed and really have an economy that that lifts up um, everyone, particularly the most disadvantaged communities. And, and there's a lot of consultation that goes along with that. At this point, we've done probably 200 separate meetings on offshore wind, about 30 public workshops and hearings, and that will uh, continue as we move forward. Um, so governor's passionate about it. Uh, I think all of us at the Energy Commission, all of our fellow agencies are, are excited to get this going. Um, and, you know, I would say there is, with every new technology, there's always some resistance, some skepticism. Uh, we saw this with rooftop solar uh, that got, you know, I think widely panned and dismissed when it was first sort of introduced programmatically. And now we have a million and a half rooftop solar systems. We're adding 400 a day. We saw this actually originally with land-based wind uh, and other, and even geothermal. Um, and I think, you know, the the main thing we need to, to just keep in our hearts and our minds is, um, the vision that uh, we're gonna scale this just like all the others. Uh, this is particularly valuable because it's uh, filling an important niche that I think is highly complementary to the rest of the renewable portfolios that we have. And, and ultimately, you know, to remember that 40% of our gas fleet in California is located in disadvantaged and low-income communities. And ultimately, you know, you want to retire those facilities, you have to have clean alternatives. So I'm excited about offshore wind. I come out of the solar industry, I've been involved in solar policy for uh, my tenure before I, I joined the Energy Commission. I believe that after rooftop solar, offshore wind is actually the lowest impact form of electric generation in the world. Uh, and so we want to you know, thoughtfully scale it up here. And I, I really believe there's a lot of benefits, not just to the state, but to the country when we do that and increase our, our energy independence, increase our manufacturing. Um, and I, in closing, I would say one of the things that's been really wonderful is having the Biden administration come in and really have a shared vision. And that's manifesting both in the good work that the Boehm staff did to move the lease along in a timely manner. Uh, that's a very heavy lift. I do not want to minimize how hard that was for them to do and get that done last year. But also with these tax credits to finally have a regime where we have a you know, 10 plus year, 30% uh, tax credit available to help drive down costs. You know, the fossil fuel industry has been subsidized for over a century. The oil depletion allowance has been around since 1926. And to finally have some long-term tax credits that help drive down costs for renewables and, and get to scale um, is really exciting. So it's been a wonderful partnership, super excited for the next chapter. And um, I think I'll, I'll stop there and turn it over to Stephanie. Let me just take a minute and say thank you very much, Chair. That was quite a review of all the work that we've done here in California. And it's really a perfect setup to lead into Stephanie, the Executive Director of Turn Forward, who's taking a lot of this work that's happening in sort of segments of the country and applying it to, to sort of how do we combine all of that work all over and, and sort of accelerate offshore wind, not just in one particular part of the country like California or the Northeast, but how do we get America to meet the goals that the president has set out 
and that that will continue to move us forward. So, Stephanie, it's a real pleasure for me to introduce you. You've been working on offshore wind for decades now. You're really one of the experts in the country when it comes to how does this technology work and, and how do we bring it to scale? And, and um, it's, it's a real thrill for me be, to be able to introduce you on this panel um, and give you some time to sort of talk about what Turn Forward is and, and what are the next steps that we should be taking? Well, thank you very much, um, Dan. And, and I appreciate being here and um, just wanna again, congratulate uh, and thank Chairman Hookshill for all the work that California is doing uh, in offshore wind. I will say, uh, you may say that you are the last or you may be the latest on the map, but you're definitely leading in the way that you're handling offshore wind. And so uh, that is that is welcome and appreciated all across the country. Um, so just before I get started, you can see the uh, my my title slide, is that right? Yeah, we can see the slides on the side too. So I think okay. if you go to slideshow there, go. there yep. that's perfect. Okay. There you go. Okay, so yes, um, so I'm Stephanie McClellan, the Executive Director of Turn Forward. Um, really briefly, Turn Forward is a new national uh, independent nonprofit organization. We just launched at the end of 2023 um, with an ambitious vision for American offshore wind. Uh, and working with our allies and partners, what we want to do and what we are doing is advancing American offshore wind power in a way that addresses our economic equity and environmental challenges, uh, as well as rising to meet the climate challenge. And so, um, you know, uh, Chairman Hochschild, uh, you know, indicated um, that the Biden administration has put us on a on a path, a uh, commitment to 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030, um, which was a, a, a real milestone and a real uh, momentous occasion for US offshore wind. Um, and, and just recently, uh, you know, earlier this year, or I guess late, later last year in 2022, they also set a goal of 15 gigawatts of floating wind by 2035 specifically. Uh, turn forward, our goal is that to see that by 2025, that the nation is on a path towards 100 plus gigawatts. We don't necessarily, we're not trying to set a target. We're not looking for a big federal executive order with a number, but we believe that the nation and state should have plans in place collectively um, that would put us on a path towards 100 plus gigawatts. And all the work that needs to be done for offshore wind, it's really important uh, in the way that California is, is showing uh, through all of their leadership that we need to get started now. You know, we need to make sure that, um, you know, that the plans are in place to, to make sure that not only do we, can we generate this amount of, of electricity from offshore wind, but that we reap the benefits from it. Um, and so, you know, this is, Dan has asked to, you know, kind of provide a little bit of information about what's going on around the country. Um, I will just say that, you know, the Biden administration's 30 by 30 uh, gigawatt goal that they set uh, when, when President Biden came into office, it both recognized and it also furthered um, the work and the commitments of states um, you know, around the country that have been setting targets quietly <laughs> in some cases um, and you know, in, in big, bold ways uh, in places like New York uh, you know, just a few years ago. So this is all work um, with the exception of, of California, really, um, work that had really happened prior to the Biden administration. So um, states since 2010, the first offshore wind target uh, was committed to, believe it or not, by the state of New Jersey. Uh, and Governor Chris Christie signed that bill uh, in 2010, early 2011. Maryland followed, Massachusetts followed, New York followed. Um, and we just saw sort of a state by state, you know, just kind of not, not a competition necessarily, um, but you just saw the, the, the targets get bigger. And really with an understanding by these states, when they looked at their decarbonization needs, they would say, how are we going to get there? And invariably, they came to the answer, we're not going to be able to do this without offshore wind. And so what you see now is the states themselves, this includes the California planning goal of 25,000 gigawatts, um, but you see that the states themselves is committed to and either uh, binding legislation, executive order, planning goals, targets of, of, of different kinds um, in a climate plan uh, or just a, a state's uh, uh, own, um, you know, energy uh, agency uh, declaring a target of roughly around 75 gigawatts of offshore wind. And this is, you can see here in the column with the dates, this is in various uh, timeframes, but really we're looking at, you know, the, 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 lar the, the furthest out is really that 2045, um, which is, you know, only 20 years away. So as we say, we, we need to get on the path uh, to making sure that we're going to be able to not only 
generate this, but that we're going to be able to integrate it, that we're going to be able to manufacture it here in the United States, and that we're going to benefit workers and we're going to do it in a way that protects marine and coastal resources in the process. So, um, so okay, let me just move on here. Um, and so just to, to talk about, you know, this is, one can look at that, uh, that chart that I just showed and, and can conclude, oh, this is just a coastal state, um, you know, this is just a coastal state play. This is really only a coastal state interest. Um, indeed, you know, purple states, red states, states all across the country are involved in offshore wind um, and, and really want offshore wind to happen. And I think this is a really important, um, you know, point to underscore here. This slide shows the supply chain of one of the United States' offshore wind developers' national supply chain. And so it's the shaded states that um, is where they are actually engaging in developing the, uh, you know, or, or, or um, fabricating and, and sourcing, um, you know, all of the different components that will go into their supply chain. So just a couple of, of things to note here. In Florida and Illinois, uh, parts are being made for the first American-made offshore service vessels, and Louisiana will assemble them. There's steel coming from West Virginia and North Carolina. Ohio is making blasting equipment and coatings for the monopiles, which on the East Coast, unlike on the West Coast, the uh, foundations are uh, pile-driven into the seabed, and so the blasting equipment and coatings will be coming from Ohio. Kansas will be making the first American-made offshore electrical substation. South Carolina is expanding a cable factory, and Texas is constructing the installation vessels and substations, all for just one of the first developers in the United States. And you know, we'll, we'll, I'll show you the, the leasing uh, map that was shown on the side of that chart uh, and on the last slide shows there are many, many developers, leaseholders. Um, and so this is just one developer's supply chain. And so, you know, as I said, we, you know, we're really um, understanding that, you know, offshore wind is is widely desirable. It's, or it's, it's incredibly desirable. It's widely desired. And we released a, a survey when we announced Turn Forward's formation in November, um, revealing that seven out of 10 U.S. coastal voters support offshore wind. And that's because of its ability to provide large-scale renewable energy and create good American jobs. And despite what people sort of a knee-jerk reaction, uh, majorities did not say they're worried about its impact on viewshed or tourism. And instead, the majorities saw that offshore wind is reliable, and they thought it would be benef beneficial to both the climate and the economy. And I've been working on offshore wind for about 12 years, as Dan said, decades, but uh, it's just really over just one decade, Dan. Um, and I'll just say that, you know, this moment when we have widespread, widespread public support, major industry milestones, and a robust offshore wind program I guess, I guess, across the whole government, this was unimaginable just a couple of years ago. There was real debate about whether offshore wind could really take off in the US. And so today, with this strong momentum for more offshore wind power, policy and advocacy attention now has to be focused on making sure that offshore wind's positive impacts are as broad and deep as our use of offshore wind is going to be. And that's what our mission is at Turn Forward. Um, I'm going to just move the slide down here. Um, and so when we launched in uh, late last year, we did so with partner organizations, the National Wild Federation, uh, National Wildlife Federation, Natural Resources Defense Council, Brightline Defense and Climate Jobs National Resource Center. And our focus is on really ensuring that as we move from this debate about how much offshore wind or is offshore wind going to happen in the United States, that we're really talking about how do we make sure that offshore wind is built in a way that creates good American jobs, that, that lifts communities, and that protects marine and coastal resources in the process. Um, this is just a photo here of workers that helped to install the Block Island wind farm, our largest offshore wind farm on the east coast of five turbines. Um, and we know that 30 gigawatts of offshore wind is expected to support 77,000 jobs, um, empower 10 million homes, and achieving our national goals of, like I said, states are, are, are almost north of 75 gigawatts at this point, will support far more. And so it's not just a question of the number of jobs, but the quality of those jobs and the protections for workers. We also need to make sure that offshore wind lifts communities, and we are seeing that on the, on the East Coast. Um, an example is Brayton Point in Somerset, Massachusetts. 
It was once the site of the largest coal-fired power, power plant in New England. And that small photo just above the text there uh, is a photo from when um, it was uh, decommissioned, is a nice way to put it, um, from being a coal-fired power plant. And now it's going to help launch, launch the offshore wind industry with port logistics and cable transmission. So this is really replacing a source of dirty energy and really creating um, a hub for jobs. There's many other um, examples of this. Uh, Brooklyn, this is uh, the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal in Sunset Point, New York. If you haven't uh, read about the, the transition that's happening there, um, I encourage you to look it up. This was an article that was in Canary Media that sort of goes through, uh, through the story of really how a community is working with a developer and with state policymakers and city policymakers um, to make sure that offshore wind benefits their community uh, and, and does so in a way that, um, that, is, that is equitable um, and that really places community first. Um, and I just want to, you know, also, again, give a nod to both Boehm, as, as Chairman Hochschild did, but also to California. Um, the, the auction that Chairman Hochschild mentioned was held last year. Um, you know, it was the first time that uh, what's called a multi-factor auction ensured that bidders, um, offshore wind developers who were bidding uh, on lease space, would um, get credits to enter into community benefits agreements or invest in workforce training or supply chain development, and really making sure that offshore wind is going to um, do, and any leaseholder now who who holds a lease, their lease stipulations will require that they make efforts to enter into project labor agreements, require engagements with tribes and underserved communities, ocean users, as well as other uh, community agencies. And so it's not just one community that has worked really hard to get this done. This is now policy and it's state policies. It's federal policy working together to make sure that offshore wind reaches its potential um, as, as, as a great uh, you know, mover of, of a just transition. Um, I just also want to say that you know, we at Turn Forward uh, believe that for offshore wind to develop to the point that, um, that we need it for a climate solution, that offshore wind development and installation, construction, and operations, um, it must protect marine life and coastal resources. And so we know that protecting whales, protecting marine mammals, it means, for example, knowing where they are. So whether or not that science and data, uh, you know, monitoring, adaptation, um, th this, is, this is the area that we need to now make sure um, has as much attention as did, for example, the creation of state markets over the past decade. Um, just, you know, some forums for advancing U.S. offshore wind, um, you know, the federal government, whether or not it's through leasing, whether or not it's through permits, through working with state uh, uh, stakeholders uh, in, the, in the outreach and engagement that the federal government does, but also investments, and, and Chairman Hochschild mentioned some of these tax credits, investments in research, research infrastructure, other initiatives. Um, this is all going to be really critical for making sure that we advance uh, offshore wind in the, in, in the manner um, that is really going to garner uh, the, the, the amount of public support um, that's going to allow us to move forward in, in the directions we need. State government as well. Um, when we talk about procurement processes, those contracts that developers will uh, engage in for power to sell their power from wind farms, um, that, those are also uh, con, contract, I should say contractual relationships that can invent, incentivize and require priority practices, whether or not that's investment in the supply chain, whether or not that's marine protection, whether or not that's worker protection um, or community benefits. Again, those comprehensive state and local permit reviews and requirements are yet another venue um, for advocacy and for policymakers to ensure that offshore wind is done right. Um, similarly, state governments, as again, Chairman Hochschild had mentioned, California is doing, they are continuing to engage in stakeholder outreach and engagement to inform their on ongoing decision making. Um, and, you know, states as well, what the investments that they make, the choices that they make about whether or not it's port infrastructure, supply chain facilities, um, you know, a transmission, these are all ways in which um, they can ensure that uh, they get from this industry what it is that they need. And then also working directly with industry. So whether or not that's advocates themselves um, who on the East Coast have, have uh, gotten a, uh, have an incredible track record, whether or not it's wildlife advocates. Stephanie, can I ask you just to wrap up? Because yep, we've only absolutely. got a couple minutes and I know that there's some questions there yep. that some people yep, have yep, been yep. asking. So yep, yep, that's really, um, you know, my last slide. So you would, you got me right there. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> Thank perfect. you very much. Okay.
Well, thank uh, you. Sharing. And yep. I know we've got a couple of questions and I've asked Stephen to help moderate that. One question that I got is, is sort of looking at you, Chair, which is that the chart that Stephanie showed had a number of states that sort of were saying there was a mandate for offshore wind and on California, it was a planning goal. Can you talk a little bit about sort of what the next steps are for California in terms of, of sort of putting offshore wind into the grid? Yeah, so that was the direction from the legislature to establish the state's uh, planning goal. There, um, and then there's, you know, I would say the, the work that needs to happen, I'd break into maybe five or six different buckets. There's clearly a procurement order that has to be given. Um, and then there's transmission, which has to be sorted out. And none of these, by the way, I don't, I don't want to pretend any of these are are, are easy. They're all, there's complexities with all of them. But I think at the highest level, um, the decision has been made that we as a state are going to do this. And it's really in, um, you know, this year I'm calling the great implementation. Like we just have to do all this stuff. So there's, you know, the transmission pathways have to be figured out, particularly challenging around the North Coast, I think, where there's not a lot of transmission capacity, but has some of the best offshore wind um, you know, a potential and there's, you know, whether we do subsea cable there or, or other solutions. Um, there's obviously port upgrades uh, and then there's, you know, the manufacturing strategy, the workforce strategy. Uh, and then we also want to do another lease sale. So these are a uh, long list, uh, but, um, you know, the right way to understand what the planning goal means, that is what we're driving towards. And that will be ultimately expressed in, in procurement orders. Perfect. Um, Stephen, I know we also had one question that came in that, that was sort of asking about the right whale issue um, off the coast on, on the East Coast. Let me take a stab at it and then I'll hand it over to Stephanie. As far as I understand it, at least the issue is one is that the latest is, is that offshore wind is not responsible for these, um, for the deaths of those whales. But at least in my mind, I tend to think about it as like, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be taking all steps necessary to ensure that construction of offshore wind, Stephanie, as you were saying, sort of monitoring, following up on this is done really well. Um, I don't know if either of you want to sort of add in on sort of your points there going forward. I'll go to the chair first and then go to Stephanie. On, on right whales? Well, just sort of maybe on sort of the wildlife protections that need to be put into place to make sure as we go forward that we're yeah. doing so, sort of everything we can to protect. I mean, generally, so we have 32 oil rigs in California that have been operating, you know, um, for decades. Um, uh, and they have, I know, looked at, at whale impacts. I, there's no known whale strikes for those mooring lines. Um, I'm sure there will be, you know, many more um, studies still to come. I, the other thing that's, you know, of course, being looked at is avian impacts. And I think one of the benefits of having the zones so far offshore is that uh, impact goes way, way down. Um, but this is all, you know, subject to further uh, studies. Stephanie, anything you wanted to add in? Uh, so, I mean, I'm not sure what the question was about. Oh, I've unmuted. There, there you go. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think generally speaking, right, we need to we need to know what is out there. We need to make sure that there are plans in place um, for monitoring, for adaptation, um, and for the best protections that we can get, whether or not that is practices by the industry, whether or not there are technical solutions um, that can be brought to bear. But, you know, there's um, on the East Coast, you know, one of the one of the real protections, or I shouldn't say one of the real protections, but one of the real uh, forces here that I hear discussed on the West Coast is uh, what's called the Regional Wildlife Science Alliance, which is a, or coalition, I think it is now, collaborative. Um, and what it is, it's federal governments, state governments, developers, and advocates that come together to understand what is the research agenda that we need for this particular ecosystem. And then to, to you know, to, to make sure that the funding is there, to make sure that the right questions are known and then are answered. Um, so I'm not sure if the question was about wildlife protection or specifically about uh, right whales, but I'll I'll leave it there. Well, I, I think that's it. Stephen, I think we've got, I mean, we're, we're a little bit over. So maybe if we've got one more question that you can call out to me or else we'll say thanks to everybody and, and um, thanks to the panelists. But is, is there one more question that we can squeeze in? 
Um, yeah, we can squeeze in one more. Um, so one question we got is, is there a future for offshore wind in the Great Lakes region? Stephanie, I think this one's for you, but I'm sure the chair would be happy. <laughs> um, well, you know, I think, um, I think there's a lot of questions still to be answered there in terms of, um, of ice, icing um, there's you know that that's again uh, a different environment it's a different ecosystem um, and it's just really I think you know under discussion and there certainly are developers that are looking at it um, you know when we look at what's going to be needed uh, to reach our net zero or decarbonization goals in the United States um, there are there are certainly many that would say that we don't do that without offshore wind off of every coast um, but I think that you know we've uh, uh, we'll 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 look to see what the states themselves want to do, um, and there certainly will be need to be uh, plenty of uh, of advocates in the space to make sure that uh, the right questions are asked and answered. Well, thanks. I want to be respectful of every, everyone's time, especially our two speakers here who've got really busy days. And chair, I, I know you've got a lot of things to attend to today. Um, and so, first of all, I'll say thank you for um, sort of joining and I'll, I'll sharing your wisdom. We've got a couple more questions. I think the staff from Environment America are gonna take a crack at sort of answering those and then getting that back out. Um, we've got information that we can share for getting in contact with um, Stephanie and uh, for chair with you, we'll, we'll have some of your staff from the CEC who may be able to answer questions and also serve as the buffer um, and sort of the go-between to make sure that we can get those questions out. And if there's important connections that need to be made, we'll also help to facilitate that. Um, I'll close by saying thanks all for participating. We had folks from all over the country um, from I think about 15 different states joining in to listen to this and, and to really take advantage of what's next with offshore wind. So uh, thanks to both of our speakers and thanks to Environment America for hosting this and we'll see everyone um, soon. Thanks again. Thanks, thanks guys. All right.